Hi, I'm Matthew Collings. Welcome to the last programme in this series about Renaissance painting. We've forgotten how to value the Renaissance. We're so familiar with its effects, so used to that magnificent, grand coherence that it has, that we almost don't think about it. I'm going to take that impression apart and put it back together again to see what makes it tick. See how the micro relates to the macro. We think of these sites as belonging to the heritage industry. It's the art that came before modern art. But when it was done, it was modern art. It was artists trying out new things at a time when society was rocked by new ideas about meaning and reality. In each programme, I look at one great work. Between them, they sum up the range of mood that Renaissance art offers. So far, it's been Disturbing Symbols in the Garden of Earthly Delights by Hieronymus Bosch. And Radiant Light in the Madonna of the Meadow by Raphael. In this programme, it is the space that Piero della Francesca creates in his Baptism of Christ that I'm going to be concentrating on. Piero was the pioneer whose ideas made possible the art of Leonardo, Michelangelo and Raphael. Piero painted figures and objects composed in a space that goes back very far to distant hills. At the same time, these are shapes composed across the surface of a flat piece of wood. I'm going to be explaining exactly how it is that space in a painting can create drama and emotion. I'm going to be saying where it's happening and how it works. Baptism is usually a purification ritual where you're received into the church. But when it's Christ being baptised, that's something different. Historically, the church and Christianity didn't exist yet. They would both come later. When Jesus is baptised, it's to become a purer kind of Jew. The baptism of Jesus is probably a historical event. As with Jesus, John the Baptist is very likely a real figure. And the purification ritual he performed on people involving immersion in water is about rebirth, washing away the sins of the past, starting a new life in anticipation that this world will very soon, any day in fact, come to an end and there will be a last judgment, a final reckoning. That is the historical version of what you're looking at. The mythological, biblical version is what Piero is interested in. His own original interpretation of the gospel story. Coming out of the wilderness, Christ asks John to baptise him in the River Jordan. Also standing in the river as it meanders back into the picture is someone else waiting to be baptised, taking his shirt off. Maybe it's Jesus in a moment before as a flashback or a flash forward as he puts his shirt back on. It's not something you can look up in a book. It's Piero thickening the richness of his scene with a suggestive detail. The story of the baptism, which happens in a few lines in the Gospels, is the first time in the Bible that the concept of the Trinity is mentioned, the three-part nature of God, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Here's the traditional visual sign for the Holy Spirit, a dove. And here is a peculiarly Renaissance representation of Christ, a sort of physically perfect man, like a Greek god, like a statue. But we're missing the whole set. Where's God? 
There used to be an image of him above the painting, on an elaborate frame now lost. Faint remains of thin gold lines show light rendered in the medieval way, like stylized rays, coming down from God through the Holy Spirit. So the way space is organized in this painting told its original audience something new and fresh about the Holy Trinity. For modern people who live in a mostly secular society, the beauty of the space is felt just as keenly, but we're unsure what it tells us. Renaissance people felt its connection to the idea of Christ as the centre of existence. With us, it's a feeling that our world lacks something, and maybe art provides it. And maybe the pleasure of art is at the root of it. Pleasure isn't just niceness or a break from the heavy. The heavy actually is in the pleasure of art. Pleasure is the place where profundity is. And the pleasure of this is in the delicacy of the space that Piero is painting. It comes from a combination of elements. The sort of wispiness of the clouds, the tiny amount of water pouring on the head, the delicate, elegant distance between the head and the bowl, the glow around the head, the wispy cloth across this body, the pretty light angel's wings, the careful segmentation of the leaves in the tree above, so that those leaves seem incredibly unreal. All those delicate touches that animate the space of the painting also bring the story to life. There are angels present, and there are great figures who might be prophets or kings present. And there is a feeling of radiant, fresh brightness, as if every object in the natural world is suddenly heightened, as if the whole world is surprised, because by this action, Christ becomes Christ the Redeemer, the Saviour, this momentous event. And that's why the scene is important. Already the layered nature of the beauty of the space is coming through. Ordinary life experience in the time of the Renaissance is another layer. In the background of Piero's Renaissance landscape, he pictures Jerusalem using as a model the place where he lived, a little town in central Italy called San Sepulcro. Between the blobs and the reality is the time nearly 600 years ago when Piero was born, in about 1412. he travelled a lot to paint commissions, he always returned to this base. The look of the place, as it was in his time, a small medieval walled town, is as important in the baptism of Christ as the surrounding countryside, which has hardly changed today. The same walnut trees glinting in the light on the hills today. Piero puts one in next to Christ. Space, life, nature. And politics, yet another layer. It's likely that the baptism was painted for Camaldolite monks, whose abbey was in San Sepulcro. The big political issue for them was the split in the Christian church between the East and the West. 
the particular order of monks that the picture was painted for, or that it was very likely done for, has close ties with the Eastern Christian Church, which is based in Constantinople. The head of the order, and it's a very widespread order, very powerful order, the head, who's a humanist scholar and a philosopher and a kind of religious politician, he advocates union between the Eastern and Western churches, largely for military reasons. It's so that Western troops might go out and help defend Constantinople against invasion by Muslim Turks. The monks explain these issues to Piero and discuss them with him, and he has to come up with a way to fuse political meaning with religious symbols. The great men witnessing the event wear Eastern Church clothing. The angels, who would be holding Christ's clothes in a traditional depiction of the baptism of Christ, are actually holding hands, the traditional sign of unity. The troops were never sent and Constantinople fell to the Turks in 1453, a few years after the baptism was painted. Piero often used the bold shapes of Eastern Church clothing to create points of visual intensity in his paintings. His audience would have been alert to this look. There was a great fear that the whole of the West would be next in the Islamic takeover. All these different types of meaning are given a particular form by Piero, both very flat and very spatial, both very meditative and very real. He grew up with this purely medieval altarpiece by Nicola de Senio. The focus is Christ rising from the dead. It's a very rich and powerful work in a basically Middle Ages tradition. A complicated object with a lot of exciting spiky shapes, painted gold, which would have related to the architectural shapes of whatever church it was in when it was originally made, and a rich cast of painted characters whose every position of face, gesture, body is carefully calculated to activate those shapes. Every picture and object in the churches that Piero knew as a teenager would have given him his visual language. But something like this would have seemed the most ambitious and highest that visual art could go. It would have summed up the teenage Piero's visual horizons. The symbolic world in medieval art, where everything's gold, becomes the real world in Renaissance art. Piero's own hills, trees, his town. These were the everyday settings for scenes of miraculous events. He painted religious pictures for the town's various institutions, churches, monasteries, civic buildings. Only a handful of the paintings survive. There were scenes that didn't just happen in the Bible long ago. The idea was that they happened forever, in eternity. That happened all the time to everyone, everywhere. They're happening now. When Piero painted the risen Christ, which he knew so well,